Again, my name is Greg Endress. I work as extension agronomist at the Carrington Research Extension Center. And for my presentation this morning, I, I do want to um, share some information on uh, variety testing that NDSU has done. And then I'll, the bulk of my discussion will be on plant establishment. So I thought it'd be useful to show this slide. This is the pros and cons of, of uh, dry bean production. I'm not gonna go through each of the bullet points, but I just wanted you to be aware, especially as a newer dry bean grower, uh, some of the um, strength of, of having dry beans in your uh, crop plans, and of course, some of the challenges as well. So as you look through the, the pros, as well as the, the cons, I'll bring those up as well. Um, during the course of the morning, our speakers will be, will be discussing most of these. And again, I'd, I'd wanna go through all these now, but uh, just for your, your information, and certainly if there's some of these factors that are not covered, uh, be sure to ask, and we'll, we'll try to cover those as, as well as, as we can. All right, so here's the three basic subjects that I wanna cover. One is variety performance. I wanna discuss uh, a plant establishment table. And then I wanna quickly go through some of our newer uh, publications or revised publications on dry bean production. And, and also give you the, the take home messages from those. So here's a look at our, the cover of our dry bean variety performance guide. And this year we, we did expand it. Uh, there were more data tables, primarily from the Valley, uh, work that Juan Osorno did, NDSU's dry bean breeders. So uh, we have a few more pages, a few more tables for you to study as you make your, your variety selections for 2024. Uh, if you don't have the hard copy, they're available at extension offices or from the NDSU's bulletin room. And then certainly you can have access electronically to the publication with uh, information that's shown on the slide. And then in addition, we do have the variety selection tool, which is electronic and includes uh, data on dry bean varieties, as well as all the other crops that NDSU has, has variety tests on. So, uh, several different formats for you to get the information for your your uh, plans for the upcoming season. This is a slide that was shown by uh, Juan Osorno last Friday during the dry bean day. And I, I thought I'd show it again. It's a look at the performance of selected varieties in our, our tests from this past season and just showing by percentage point the performance as compared to the trial average. And this is across many different trials. So we uh, maybe are tooting our horn, our horn a little bit, but NDSU varieties are performing very well, especially the newer release varieties in the case of pinto beans, uh, black navies, uh, and kidneys, as well as uh, great northerns. So we're very pleased that we have a breeding program at NDSU. There's not many in the U.S. anymore, and our program is, is doing quite well. Um, in addition to the guide this year is that we do have a summary of, of uh, direct harvest ratings on pinto varieties. And so we do this visually in the field. It's done at, at Carrington, both in the dry land and irrigated trials. And ultimately we, we have scoring to uh, indicate the success rate for bringing the beans um, home, bringing them to the bin uh, with direct harvest. And so here's a look at the chart that we, that was new that we added this year. It's uh, established pinto bean varieties. Um, it's a combination of ratings over either four or five years under the dry land and irrigated environments, and then the nine year average. So we hope this will be something useful if you're considering direct harvest and that's becoming uh, more and more common. And as you consider other characteristics of varieties, this information should help you make a, um, a decision about, about uh, direct harvest. And of course, we do have many of the newer varieties that we have limited numbers on those. If you look in the guide, you'll see um, the Carrington data from this past season, both dry land and irrigated. We include some of the newer pintos, such as uh, ND Rodeo. And we also have uh, information on other market types and the corresponding varieties. So I hope you'll make use of that information. And this was my first attempt to be the lead author of the publication. And there's always things I wish we had um, 
include, <clears throat> included. And so this is my wish list that we hope we'll include in the future. One is uh, we do have a fair amount of SCN, soybean cyst nematode tolerance based on market classes and varieties within those. And Sam Markell, when he gives this presentation, uh, he does plan to show a slide that, that highlights that information. And then another bit of information relating to disease is that we do have a limited database on, on bacterial blight ratings. As one example, here's a, a look at um, some limited test results by NDSU on common bacterial blight for pintos, blacks, as well as navies. So it would just seem logical that having this information in the variety guide would be very useful to, to consider the whole scope of factors as we choose varieties. All right, listen, next move to plant establishment. That'll be the balance of, of my discussion. And if you've heard me talk about soybeans, I've very likely displayed a, a table that we've compiled over the last decade or so, just looking at some um, important plant establishment factors. And then about this time last year, I thought it'd be really important to do this with dry beans. So we, we did this. We have seven factors present, primarily on pinto beans, but as noted, we do have some information for black and navies. And what we're after here is, is uh, if a person is starting with the factors under option B column, uh, we'd encourage you to consider going to option A because of, in many cases, a significant yield in increase and it's listed by percentage and it's based on the trials that are listed and conducted essentially across the state but primarily in the eastern part of the state and over the last two decades actually. So the factors that are listed that have bold print are, are those factors that will um, at least briefly discuss during the course of the, the morning's agenda. And then as an example on how we apply this, uh, let's consider plant stand. This would be four pintos. Of course, the long-term recommendations for wide-rolled pintos was to establish an early season stand of about 70,000. But in our recent work, we found average over three trials that uh, there was about a 5% yield increase by bumping that, that population up in combination with having narrower rows. So being in the mid 80s, 80,000 for plant population um, gave us uh, increase in, in yield potential. I also wanna mention that being an option A isn't the ending point, especially for some of these factors like plant stand or even row spacing, because uh, you can still fine tune plant stand most certainly based on a farm or field and all the other characteristics that you consider such as varieties and soil characteristics, et cetera. And then one final point about this, this uh, table is that there's some that are, I have slightly grayed. That means that uh, the yield was similar or there's very minimal um, yield increase. And so just take a look at those um, as an example uh, with planting date, we, we did some work, actually six trials where we looked at various planting dates. And in general, we didn't see a, a, a decline in yield by planting earlier than normal. And by normal, I mean the last 10 days in May and the first week or so in, in June. But keep in mind that we did not test the slow darkening varieties. And I know initially there was some concern that they maybe have a little less vigor and with cooler soils that might... Um, enhance that that concern. So anyway, I want to make that comment, the grade factors of those to uh, scrutinize a bit. So with that, I'm going to move on to other information. So I'm actually on the third bullet already, and that is to look at some of our, our newly revised or brand new production guides on uh, dry beans and give a, a quick summary relating to those. So this is uh, the 2022 season dry bean grower survey. You might be pleased to hear that there's no survey in 2023. So this guide is, is, in my opinion, very useful. It's good for new growers, certainly good for experienced growers. Uh, there's lots of details in there to help fine tune uh, dry bean production. In addition, it's useful for we at NDSU for educational programs, as well as for identifying maybe some, some uh, opportunities in, in research. So a real concern in dry bean production is soil erosion. 
And so these, there's one picture that shows erosion of a conventionally tilled field and another one where there was significant plant injury due to wind damage on a conventional tilled uh, field of, of newly emerged dry bean. And so we'd sure like to minimize both of these, these uh, negative factors. And we can do this, um, of course, with reduced tillage as well as maybe use of cover crops. So I'm going to talk a little bit about those. Uh, this is from the survey in, in 2022. We asked growers about what tillage system they use. And the majority, about 75%, said that they are using the conventional tillage system. In parentheses is the 2018 data just to see the changes, but there really weren't any. So we would certainly like to see more of the conservation tillage. Um, we'd like to see those numbers go up in the future because of, of a reducing the risk of soil erosion and, and some other benefits as well. Um, at Carrington, we did do some, some comparison of tillage work with dry beans, with pintos, including a fall strip till. We found that the response to dry beans with fall strip till was similar to the yield response with conventional till. Plus, we have all the advantages with strip till, including reducing uh, potential for soil erosion. We do have a publication on strip till that gives um, a lot of the general information and also the has information on, on dry bean performance, as well as other crops such as corn, sugar beet, sunflower, and soybean. So check that out if a strip till would be something of interest to you. And then we have done work at Carrington with uh, winter rye as a preceding cover crop before pintos. And uh, we did this for reasons I've already mentioned, reducing soil erosion might help with, with uh, managing um, excessive soil moisture in soil, certainly may help us add another tool in the weed control toolbox. And so we tried to answer some of those basic questions that are listed. And I'm going to show you the slide. The next slide will show information about the yield and rye termination timing. With weed control, we found that if the, lie, the rye is allowed to grow until planting time, and in this, in this case, with the study, we always plant in late May, early June, and the rye performed as well in suppressing weeds such as foxtail and kochia as a pre-emergence herbicide. However, there is a restriction with that, and the rye did use topsoil moisture that, that uh, caused some challenges with, with correctly establishing the dry bean. And I'll bring that up now in this next slide. So here's an average over four years of yield with uh, the various treatments as compared to the conventional system check. So when we terminated the rye, at least two weeks and up to five weeks before he planted the dry bean, we saw similar yield performance as the, the conventional yield. So that was good news along with uh, proper management. But notice that when we um, delayed the termination of the rye until planting time, we planted green, that was good for weed control and protecting the soil. But uh, during the years of the study, we always had relatively dry springs, the topsoil dried out with allowing the rye to grow up to planting time and that was detrimental for having a, a quickly and, and uh, adequate plant stand of the dry beans to the order of we lost yield of at least 20% when we delayed the termination of rye at planting time. So that's a real quick summary of what we found. If you want details, yes, we have a publication on that. All right, dry bean rolling. Um, in our core survey, uh, this was from 2021. Um, we asked people, uh, did you roll or not as part of your dry bean production strategy? And about a third of the people did not. Of those that replied, they indicated that the most common time was pre-emergence rolling right after planting. And we relied on the Canadians for some information to see how, how dry beans perform. This is data from Manitoba, a very simple trial where they looked at no rolling and compared it to rolling right after planting or rolling after the plants had emerged about a week after. And so as you suspect, if we roll when the plants are up, there's gonna be some damage. But what's interesting is the plant density and more importantly, the yield was not affected by the rolling timing. 
But I've always wondered, why don't we have data in North Dakota? But finally, this past season, we have some. And it was a study spearheaded by Dr. Joel Eichley. And Joel will be on a little later this morning to talk about uh, the study where we looked at rolling and the interaction with the application of pre and post herbicides. So I'm gonna talk just very briefly about the plant response to rolling and Joel talked about the, the weed control results. So in these pictures, uh, I took these right after we, we rolled with the, after the plants were up, we rolled at the V2 stage. And as you can imagine, uh, we had uh, plants that were pushed over and in, numerous cases, we had plants that had split or, or uh, even worse, damage to the stems and, and other parts of the plant. So here's a, a summary of what we found on, on pinto bead injury. We had none when we rolled pre-emergence, but when the plants were up, we did have mechanical damage, and there were two sites in Cass County that had relatively minimal damage with post-emergence rolling. At Carrington, we saw more anywhere from about 20 to about a third of the plants that we investigated did have some type of mechanical injury. However, plant stand was the same amongst rolling treatments. And at least at Carrington, we took the, the trial to yield. We did not see any difference in, in yield amongst rolling treatments. All right, to wrap up here, um, we have done some work in the last decade looking at the interaction of the three major market types of dry beans to plant population and row spacing. And what we're really after is as we narrow rows, should we increase, increase plant populations to increase the yield potential? So these were agonomic studies and I wanted to define row spacing and I've done that. Uh, narrow, intermediate and wide. And then I certainly want to emphasize that in these studies that took place in Minot, Carrington, Langdon, and a couple locations in the Northern Valley, we did not have uh, white mold to the level that it, it impacted yield. But Michael Vunch, a plant pathologist at Carrington, he's done work looking at roles and plant populations in the present site of white mold. If you want that information, here's a QR code to investigate that, or you can check out our website. And the other aspect of this, before I show you the information, is, is on economics. And we're assuming that, that uh, it'd be most profitable if you have existing equipment to allow you to go from wide to narrow rows. If not, if you have to purchase equipment, you certainly need to fact that, that in on the, the potential for yield increase with uh, increased plant populations and, and narrow rows. So here's a summary, a very quick summary of what we found with the three market types over the years. With blacks, we didn't see a yield response with increasing plant populations. And keep in mind, this is comparing yield response where we had uh, the traditional wide rolls, 30 inch rolls, and the traditional plant populations of 70,000 in pintos and 90 in the smaller seeded blacks and navies. So with blacks, we did see a yield response with narrow rows. With the navies, we saw a yield potential increase with the narrow rows and with uh, established early season plant po population exceeding 115,000 plants per acre. With pintos, we found the intermediate rows as defined and plant populations greater than 80,000 gave us our highest yield potential um, in these studies. And if you want details, we do have a publication with the Black and Navy work, as well as the Pinto work. And then my last data slide is on the other end of the scale on plant populations. I've been curious through the years with the trials we've conducted at Carrington, we don't always reach the optimum stands. In fact, uh, we have eight trials where we had Pinto stands early season establishment where we were under 50,000. So I graphed these and the, and the corresponding yield. And with the exception of 2021, the drought year where lots of rules were broken and you see that the yields were terrible and the plant populations weren't very good either. But overlooking these two trials, note the other six trials, even though we had low plant populations ranging from 32,000 to just under 50, that we had adequate, and in one case, exceptional yields. Here we had over, over 30 bags with a plant population of about 47,000 plants. 
So what I'm getting at is uh, don't give up on a, a low density field too quickly. Unfortunately, oftentimes the density is not uniform through a field. And so that poses challenges on deciding whether to keep the field or not. And, um, but if a person does, it just requires more management. There's probably going to be more weed pressure and more variability in plant staging, but uh, it does rely, require more, more management in a crop that already requires a lot of management. So I thought this would be a, a useful to show you. And that's the, the end of the prepared comments that I have for you. Mm -hmm.